We all want that, don't we? Yeah. Yes? Yeah. yeah. Yes, we want that, right? Okay. So we've been looking at submission the last few weeks in our study in uh, 1 Peter. So I really like how Peter starts uh, verse 8 in 1 Peter, where we're starting today, where he says, uh, finally. So finally, we're done talking about submission, which can be a difficult subject. But we're not quite done. But we are close. And Peter closes this section with some encouraging and practical instructions on how we can have better God-honoring relationships with others through submission. And I would hope that this is something that we all want to have. And with it comes a blessing, too, and we're going to talk about that as well. So before we begin our reading, let's, uh, let's pray. Father God, we do thank you, Father, for your word, Lord. We thank you, Father, for your Holy Spirit, Lord, that, that uh, inspired uh, the Apostle Peter to write these words so we can read them these many, many years later, Lord, and just apply them to our walks today. So, Father, we thank you, Father, for your word, Lord. We thank you for how it teaches us and how it grows us and how it molds us, Lord. And, Father, we thank you so much for your son, Jesus, and his example and his sacrifice. And we pray all these things in his name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so 1 Peter chapter 3 Let's start with verses uh, 8 and 9 then. So finally, all of you, be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Love as brothers. Be tender-hearted. Be courteous. Not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing. Knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. So last week, Peter focused on submission in the context of marriages and we had asked everyone, you know, married or not, please pay attention to the principles of submission that Peter was presenting. So in verse 8 today, Peter addresses who? All of you. So that's all of you, all of us. That's you and me. That's all of us as believers. So these closing instructions are for all believers. So let's look at each one or each instruction individually, if we could, please. So first off, he says, we are to be of one mind. That does not mean that we're all to think alike and be the same. Christianity is not a cult. In a cult, everyone thinks the same, and that's whatever the cult leader teaches. Conformity is the operative principle in cults. Harmony is the operative principle in Christianity. The one mind in Christianity is to have the mindset of Christ or his principles, as we discussed last week. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16 says, we have the mind of Christ. While we all have the mind of Christ as believers, we do not all see things the same way or experience the same things. We can't expect everyone to be just like us. God has built us through both unity and righteous diversity among all his people. So think about it this way. We could say that the Christians are like a choir. Each one sings with his or her own voice. Some sing different parts of the arrangement, but everyone sings to the same piece of music and in harmony with each other. I think that's a good example of that Christian unity. Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2 says this, Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, the loving of one accord, of one mind. So before we look at the next instruction from Peter, let me address one other thing when it comes to being like-minded and what it is not. So see, we are all the body of Christ with different functions and different ministries in the body, just like our physical body, as Paul points out in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. So as I said earlier, we can't and shouldn't expect everyone to be like us. And that's the same when it comes to the functioning and ministering in the body of Christ. Your ministry may be to this group of people, or in this manner, or in this country, or even another country like we talked about. That doesn't mean that everyone else needs to minister to the same group or in the same manner in order to be in step with God's plan for them. So we need to remember that, that diversity. You know, we shouldn't try to make everyone the same or have the same function in the ministry or in the body. And we shouldn't pressure them to do so either. Should we encourage each other to minister and even go outside of our comfort zone? Yes. But remember what the Bible tells us about the diversity of each person's ministry, and we need to respect that. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 13. 
And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge to the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And then later on in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 10 and 11, Peter writes, As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another, as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and that dominion forever and ever. Amen. Amen. So let's look at the next instruction, which is to have compassion. Or in the NIV it says to be sympathetic, which I like. I read the original compound word that we get the word sympathetic comes from the two words suffer and with. So it means to suffer with. We should empathize with others, whether they are suffering or whether they are in joy. Romans 12, 15 through 16. Romans 12, 15 through 16. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. So Peter tells us to love as brothers. And that word he used for love is Philadelphia, which is where we get the name for the city of Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. And then Jesus commands us to love one another. John 13, 34 through 35, Jesus says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all will know what, that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Now, some will say, okay, I'll love them, but I don't have to like them. Useless. Is that a true statement? Can you really love someone without liking them? Yes. I am going to have a different opinion here, Richard. Thank you for your input, though. I agree. Would our dislike for that person inhibit our ability to love them? If we don't like someone, don't we also try to avoid them? How can we minister to each other if we are avoiding each other? Jesus seemed to get along with all of his disciples, even when they were not that easy to get along with. If you read some of those gospel accounts, sometimes it wasn't so easy. Now, using the example of Jesus and his disciples, he did have his close-knit group, you know, Peter, James, John. So we could say that, yes, there will be those that you may hang out with, more or have a closer relationship with, and that's okay. You know, we oftentimes have closer relationships with those that we have more in common with, or, or we just get along better with. But that shouldn't mean we dislike others. And yes, I know that there are those who may, who may rub us the wrong way. I know that. Or there are those you just can't seem to relate to. But remember what you do have in common. Christ Jesus and build that relationship based on that you know Jesus nowhere says command us like your brothers and sisters but we are commanded to love them and I think once we start loving them then we can start to like them think about it this way you're going to spend eternity with these people that's a long time you might as well start liking them now and it works both ways you know, if you know that something that you that you do, you know, uh, irritates your brother or sister, don't do it. You know, think about it this way, too, that, you know, that maybe their likes and dislikes are different from yours. And that's fine. Maybe their sense of humor is different from yours, and that's fine. So don't push it. Push Christ between each other. If you have nothing else to talk about, you have Christ to talk about with each other. And then you can't go wrong. I remember a men's camp that I went on, and we had guys that were like, you'd have a financial planner, you'd have a guy that drove a truck, you had a guy that worked on computers, you had a guy like me who can't touch a computer, you had all this kind of mix of guys, right? And I told him, I said, you know what? Let's not talk about the sports team. Let's not talk about our jobs. Let's talk about Christ now. Let's talk about Christ on this camp. And it worked, because that we all have in common. Amen? Amen. A long time ago. 
My wife is very good at, at enlightening me on certain things. She said, don't use the word enlighten. It sounds too much. I think it's fine. <laughs> she enlightened me on what it says about mansions in heaven, what it really means. I always pictured me living in this big old mansion <laughs> on Gold Street. Maybe just my closest friends and families. And I could send them home when I got tired of them. That's not it. The true meaning is that there will be many people of God all living together in God's heavenly abode. Some of these people are going to be your roommates in heaven. Maybe bunkmates. Maybe he's on top and you're on the bottom. So let's start liking each other. Peter tells us we should be tender-hearted and courteous to one another. Tender-hearted follows along with being compassionate. Tender-hearted would mean to have a soft heart towards others. We know we shouldn't harden our hearts towards God, but we shouldn't harden our hearts towards others either. You know, the NIV translates this word courteous to be humble. I like that better. If we think of courteous, maybe we think, well, if I hold the door open for that person, or if I use proper manners around others, I'm showing them love. Well, love's a lot more than that. Humility is more closely related to submission, which is, as we have studied, that's a big part in loving someone. Yeah, I want to reread 1 Peter 3, verse 9, before we talk about it. So 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 again. He tells us, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. So verse 9 gives us another very good reason we should be blessing others instead of holding grudges against those that have wronged us or seek to get back at them. Peter says here that if we bless them instead, then we may also receive a blessing from God. We love one another but not just for the sake of Jesus. We love one another for the sake of our brothers and sisters who Jesus died for. We love one another for our own sake because by blessing those who have wronged us, we can receive this blessing from God. Our future destiny is determined by our present conduct because our future hope is that of having God bless us with eternal life then and our present relationships should be characterized by blessing others. Remember the story of Jonah? Jonah. Jonah did not want the people of Nineveh to experience God's blessings. But he did want God's blessings for himself. We can begin to think that sinners rightly deserve to be punished while we deserve to be blessed. We feel little or no obligation to be a blessing to the ungodly, but that is not what the text is telling us to do here. A person to whom God has given undeserved blessings instead of judgment should seek to give the same to someone who has wronged him. And the text says that we are called to this. If we have been called to receive a blessing, then we should be blessing others instead of cursing them, or even worse. James chapter 3, verses 8 through 12. James 3, 8 through 12. But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Thus no spring yields both salt, water, and fresh. So starting in verse 10 through verse 12 now back in 1 Peter, Peter uses verses from Psalm 34 to make his point and to give us those three steps to have those blessed relationships by God. So let's read 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 10 through 12, which he takes again from Psalm 34. For he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. So Peter's telling us how to have that rich and fulfilled life that we should all desire in these earthly relationships we have, even in the midst of conflict or hostile environments, by using these verses from Psalm 34. He tells us, through the psalm that if we want to love life 
and see good days, we should do the following three things from this psalm. First, we need to keep our tongues from evil. We need to heed James' advice we just read in James 3, 8 through 12. We need to refrain from speaking evil about or towards others. Even if they speak evil or lies about us, we are not to return the favor to them. Our speech should be pure and honest. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 29 through 32. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. So first, keep our tongues from evil. The second thing he tells us in these verses from Psalm 34 is to seek peace. Or excuse me. The second thing is turn away from evil. I'm sorry. Turn away from evil. As Peter wrote in verse 9, do not return evil for evil or reviling for reviling. We are not to be vindictive in our response to those that revile us. That's the time for turning the other cheek, as Jesus tells us in Matthew 5, 29. When we take personal offense at something someone has said or done to us because we are personally offended. And then finally, thirdly, we are to seek peace and pursue it. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 44, Jesus tells us to pray for those who persecute you. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 12, being reviled, we bless, and being persecuted, we endure, and being defamed, we entreat. This is the compassionate way a Christian should pursue peace. And again in Matthew chapter 5, verses 9 through 10, Jesus says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I know a lot of the things we talked about may be tough. And I want to close this in all honesty with everybody. Doing good, especially in a world where doing good is seen as being weak, and most people would rather do bad, doing good is often difficult. From what I have seen, many times it seems as if evil is rewarded immediately and the reward for doing good is often delayed. Sometimes we don't even see it in this lifetime. But the rewards of good in this life and all eternity are better and far more secure than the rewards of doing evil. What's it say here? God's eyes and ears are open to the righteous, but his face is against those who do evil. For believers... You know, we see that God has set a very high standard for the conduct of his children. It is an impossible standard apart from his grace and his Holy Spirit living inside of you. We are to have the mind of Christ and to seek and bless those that harm us rather than seek revenge. We are to be a blessing to those in this world, even our enemies, knowing that we are to receive God's blessings in the future and in this present lifetime. So I pray for myself and everyone that's listening. May God give us grace to do these things as the Apostle Peter has instructed us through the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father God, I do thank you, Father. I do thank you for Peter's words, Lord. Inspired by your Holy Spirit, even today your Holy Spirit speaking to each and every one of us. Father, that we would follow these instructions of his, Lord. And Father, without the Holy Spirit in us as believers, it is impossible. But Father, through your Holy Spirit, Lord, we can do these things. We can indeed be a blessing to others, Lord. And also in return, we see, receive a blessing from you as our reward. So Father, we thank you for that, Lord. And Father, I pray for all of us, Lord, that, that this struggle in these areas, Lord, it, it can't be difficult as we look out in a world where, where, uh, where good is, is mocked and, and bad is encouraged. Father, that we would be different, and we'd be different through the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord. And we'd work on it step by step, Lord, that we would not speak evil, Lord. We would not revile others, Lord. We would seek peace and pursue it. And Father, especially among our own brothers and sisters, Lord, 
we would have the heart to do that. That we would love others as you loved us. And by that, even the unbelievers would know that we are your disciples. So Father, I ask for all of us, Lord, you would strengthen us through the Holy Spirit to do that. And Father, for those of us who don't know the Lord today, that today would be a day you would look at this and say, yes, I want to have blessed relationships with my with people that I know. I want to have good relationships with them. How do I do it? Well, the Apostle Peter tells us how. But it begins with knowing Jesus and having Jesus in your hearts. I pray for anyone listening today, Lord, who hasn't accepted you as their Savior, that the Holy Spirit doesn't live in them. Today is the day, Lord, that you would be speaking to them through your Holy Spirit, Lord, and say, yes, today is the day. Have that blessed relationship with others, but more importantly, have that relationship with your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who offers it freely to you. So, Father, again, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the great example that he said and the words that he spoke, Lord, that we are to follow. And, Father, we thank you so much for your sacrifice on the cross, the blood that was shed that covers us, washes us clean. So, Father, we thank you, Lord. We love you, and we thank you so much for your son, Jesus. And we pray these things in his precious name. Amen.